Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, those that are joining us online uh, to the Consumers International Congress in Nairobi. And uh, we are so honored to have you today, uh, our session on tackling plastic pollution for consumers. We have a well-able team of speakers, but before I introduce them, I just want to maybe take you a little bit through the uh, tackling plastic pollution for consumers. So uh, by 2040, plastic pollution on Earth is estimated to weigh about 1.3 billion tons. Currently, about 40% of the world population lives in a location where the generation of plastic waste has surpassed local waste management system capacity. I think this is very, very important, uh, even as consumer organizations and consumers out there to take note. It is one of the most pressing sustainability challenges facing people and the planet. So it's the planet and the inhabitants causing damage to our health and the natural environment. In 2022, the United Nations Environmental Assembly set out to develop a globally legally binding treaty on plastic pollution. The treaty negotiations present a unique opportunity to create a safer and more sustainable world. Plastic pollution could be reduced by 80% with policy and market shifts. But the voices of the most impacted by these decisions are not often taken into account. So consumer advocates uh, are bringing their voice to the new plastic treaty negotiations to make a difference. Before I again introduce our speakers, I just want to remind everyone that we are um, are going to have an online poll um, through Slido, and maybe uh, Camila, you could just yes, allow we're everybody putting that to, up on the screen. Yeah. Please continue, and it will be there shortly. All right. So let me just get, move on to introduce our speakers. Then we we have on our panel this morning. Saruja Sanduram, who is the Executive Director of Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group, India. Welcome, Saruja. And um, two, we have Sheila Agarwal Khan, who is the Director, Industry and uh, the Economy uh, Division of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP. Welcome. And we have Christian De Boer, who represents the private sector. He's the managing director of Jaya House Hotels, SME, Cambodia. Welcome. And then we also have Daudi Sumba, who is the regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa, WWF Africa. Welcome, everybody. And um, maybe just to move on, um, Sorry. <clears throat> we are going to start with um, Sheila Agarwal Khan, the Director, Industry and Economy uh, Division of the United Nations. Maybe you could just start by telling us why is a plastics treaty necessary and maybe some of the key ambitions of a plastic pollution free planet and marketplace. Thank you. And lovely to see you all here. Um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I think there was a growing momentum that there was more and more litter being seen across the globe. And you know, you started seeing on the news, everywhere, just pictures and videos of, of plastic litter all over the place. But that was just in a way, a tip of the iceberg, because it was just the symptom of a very big problem that actually many of the impacts are actually hidden. So studies started coming out showing that actually the, the cost that society bears is something like 300 to 600 billion US dollars in costs from ecosystem services that are lost in marine and other freshwater bodies, but beyond that, there are human health impacts from the kind of additives that are going into plastics, 
that have, are some of them very harmful. That, and we're seeing growing literature coming through on that. We're seeing greenhouse gas emissions from the production of plastics to the production of products that reach consumers. We're seeing effluents that are making their way into water bodies through the whole production process. So across this whole scenario, you see a system where plastic is cheap, but that's because the, what they call externalities, these hidden costs, have actually not made it. So governments, so governments then said, well, actually, what we need to do is have a treaty, because the problem with plastics is you can't control it just domestically. When there's so much plastics being imported or exported, depending on the, the country's status, and so unless you look at the whole global market, the, it, we're not going to solve this crisis. So a global treaty started being negotiated since 2022. And we're now, actually, we've just come out of a negotiation process a few weeks ago in Nairobi. And another one will happen in Ottawa in April, followed by a f further meeting in Korea and, uh, towards the end of next year, at which point we should have a global treaty negotiated and agreed across governments globally. Some of the provisions of the treaty will be mandatory and some will be voluntary, and right now there's a process negotiating what happens where. So what will be looked at and what are the issues under discussion in the treaty? One is there's a question on reduction of plastic production because we have a lot of single-use and short-lived plastics. Many times you hear people talk of the bans that have happened in countries on plastic bags, but that's just a small sliver of the whole piece. There's plastic bottles that are single-use. There's short-lived plastics, for example, how you buy your shampoo, your conditioner, your, your cooking oil, the detergent, all of that plastic packaging ends up at some point either in a landfill or a dump site. Much of it is not recyclable because actually only 10% of what is produced is recycled in practice. Very few plastics can be mechanically recycled. Most would need chemical recycling, which have high greenhouse gas footprints, they're effluents, they're harmful additives that are coming out when you chemically recycle. So there are lots of questions on other technologies to, to really get to them, to have them viable. And of course, the cost of chemical recycling is also prohibitive. So we are producing plastics as a society that are ending up in the waste stream where the technologies are just not there to recycle them. Um, Okay, I should be a bit faster, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so the treaty is basically looking at across all the things that have to happen from how do you go to reuse systems, how do you go to recycling systems and all, and maybe I can stop there just saying that the next year and a half we'll see a treaty being negotiated which will have many different parts of the life cycle being addressed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Sheila, for that, um, uh, really introducing us and getting us to, to this discussion and also highlighting some of the key challenges that uh, even consumers face and some of the challenges that would be attributed to a contribution by the consumers themselves, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, maybe just to remind again the audience that um, Please, the poll is up, and um, you can go ahead and, and answer some of the questions that are up there. We'll be looking at these as we uh, proceed with this um, panel discussion. So I, I just want to bring in Daudi Sumba, and um, maybe just tell us a little bit, how is plastic pollution affecting our planet and the people, and why do we need to address it urgently. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, Sheila has already touched on some of the reasons why plastic pollution is affecting the health of the earth. Uh, I will try and you know, go a little bit deeper just to focus on a few things. Uh, but I come from WWF, and our job is to stop the degradation of the earth's natural environment and to build a future where humanity lives in harmony with nature. So it's at the very core of our mission to address issues around plastic pollution. Uh, and Sheila has already said it, you know, pollution, plastic pollution is really the accumulation of those harmful 
plastics in our environment. We know very well that plastics are a very poorly reversible pollutant. In other words, that uh, plastics persist for a very long time within our environment and they're not easily degradable, uh, which builds up you know, the reasons why we need to address you know, plastic pollution very, very systematically and urgently. But there are a couple of impacts that I'd like to just speak about to add to what Sheila has already said uh, of plastics pollution on our natural environment. First, we see research showing us that there's a lot of biodiversity loss associated with plastic pollution, especially in the oceans. Uh, we know that, for example, with regard to species, 17% uh, of all the species under the IUCN red list are endangered by plastic pollution. You know, that, that's a very serious issue uh, because when you get to the IUCN red list, it means that you are on the brink of extinction, so to speak. And so plastic pollution is accelerating some of those impacts. Secondly, a lot of waste, approximately 9 to 23 million tons of plastic waste is dumped into our rivers, waters, and oceans every year. That's just way too much. Way, way too much. In fact, there's a study that has shown that uh, uh, now we are having more plastics in oceans than fish. You know, and the impacts on fish and the extinction of certain species or the decline of certain species of fish is alarming because of, of course, entanglement uh, and indigestion of, of plastics by fish. And so, you know, these are all reasons why we need to intervene very, very quickly. Uh, we are seeing plastic pollution compromising ecosystem functioning, either of landscapes or seascapes. She already spoke about this. Uh, Thank you. She's spoken the, about greenhouse gas emissions. So th th there's real rationale for us yeah. to intervene. Daudi, that's, that's very, very, very important. I think uh, even when you talk about the biodiversity. Maybe I'll just pause there and allow um, um, our guest to join. We are also being joined by uh, uh, Mr. Arnaud Souquet, who is the ambassador of France to Kenya and Somalia, uh, government of France. Welcome, ambassador. Thank you. So... Uh, maybe we could just allow Daudi just to continue, and then I'll bring in Saroj. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you know, the other impacts which affect people are uh, spread of infectious diseases associated with plastics. We know that plastics in many ways are very carcinogenic and, and having various impacts on people. Uh, and so these are all rationals. The costs of health and the costs of cleaning up the environment are extremely high today. And, and this provides the rationale for us to quickly intervene to address this situation. Um, and, 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 and I think that Sheila has already spoken about one of the main ways in which we are pushing to address this situation through a, a global treaty uh, that is action-oriented, rules-based, uh, that goes beyond voluntary action to help us you know, clean up uh, the only earth that we have. Thank you. Thank you, and I like that statement, the, the only art that we have. Saroj, maybe you could weigh in to um, the same issue of how plastic pollution is affecting our planet and uh, our people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I think the entire life cycle of plastics actually affects the planet, starting from the manufacturing stage till the post-use, because uh, it is a, a byproduct of the petrochemical industry and fossil fuels, 99% uh, 19, of the uh, plastics are from fossil fuels, which in itself, uh, as we know, uh, contribute to uh, uh, pollution. And uh, then uh, during usage, there are several, um, uh, like, um, it, it, we, we find plastics to be found everywhere today. Uh, a, and there are studies that talk about microplastics and nanoplastics present in uh, uh, breast milk and also in the human blood and uh, in animals. So, uh, uh, so again, that is a problem. And also post uh, usage, as we know, like it is being uh, one is like it is being randomly thrown away, and uh, where it uh, actually ends up in the landfills and uh, uh, the the way it destroys the soil and also. Incineration is considered to be an option, 
where when it is burnt, it again actually um, uh, like uh, expels uh, toxic um, uh, fumes, which are harmful greenhouse gas emissions are there as well. So, uh, um, so uh, in my view, plastics are a problem right from the uh, through the entire life cycle, their life cycle, and uh, so it needs to be addressed. The issue needs to be addressed. So it is affecting the planet, the marine life, the human life, environment, marine life. Everything is affected. So we need to really. Um, uh, we have somehow gotten into this. I think we, it's time we actually acted upon it to see how we could come out of this issue that is affecting us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Saroj. And uh, maybe at this point, again, I want to welcome um, Mr. Arnaud Suke, the ambassador of France to Kenya and Somalia, uh, government of France. Welcome to the Consumers International Congress and welcome to this session of tackling plastic pollution for consumers. So I'll, I'll quickly maybe just uh, bring you into the conversation. Um, uh, Ambassador, and uh, considering the urgency of addressing the plastic pollution crisis, because clearly it is a crisis, could you please share the perspective of the High Ambition Coalition on the treaty and their efforts to see an ambitious agreement? Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. And, and first, apologies for, for being late. Um, very glad to, to be here with you. I think it's an important moment here uh, that you hold your Congress and your discussion in Nairobi. Um, and maybe just to give a bit of context, because Nairobi, first the seat of, of, of UNEP, uh, but also the place where the negotiation on, on, on plastic, to end plastic pollution and on this treaty, legally binding treaty to end plastic pollution, took place like last session was uh, about three weeks ago here. Um, and Nairobi also being a place where Kenya sits in this whole debate about ending plastic pollution, a special place, you know. Uh, they have been taken measures uh, also themselves, uh, banning single-use uh, plastic bags. So I think it's important, and I'm sure you know, it has a meaning that you're conducting this discussion here in Kenya. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, what you mentioned, you know, our uh, coalition uh, to end plastic pollution, you know, we have now 64 countries who have joined this um, high ambition to end plastic pollution. And I think it's a core group in terms of ambition in pushing this international a discussion and negotiation for a legally binding treaty to end plastic pollution by 2040. I think that's our common objective. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to the two leaders of this coalition, which are Rwanda and Norway. Um, and I think it's important within this international negotiation, which will be a difficult one, that the most ambitious countries are gathered together. Uh, so we're trying to, to get this legally binding treaty, and I think it's important, the, leg the legal and binding um, aspect of it is very, very important. And we are pursuing uh, collectively three priorities in this negotiation. One, I think, is to um, reduce uh, plastic production and consumption. Uh, and, I think we, and I think that has been said by other panelists, we're in a world that the consumption of plastic have quadrupled in the last 30 years. And, and obviously the issue of single-use plastic being one of the prominent ones we, we need to address. Um, but we believe in this high-level uh, coalition, ambition coalition, that it will probably come by a reduction of the production. Uh, and I think that's, that's definitely not consensual, but that's also in terms of ambition where we sit. I think the second priority, we want to also put norms, standards, uh, in order to promote circular economy. And this is a lot of a discussion with um, various governments to push the industry to develop standards, eco-design. So that's another area we'll be working on it, basically the whole sustainability aspect. And, and thirdly, and lastly, the third objective of this coalition, and to be reflected in the treaty, uh, is uh, the, um, the waste management of, of plastic. And, and it's you know, only 10% of um, 
plastic waste is recycled. And so this is definitely an area we need to, we need to improve. I'll, I'll stop it here and thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, French Ambassador. And um, it's important, again, just to take note of the numbers, 64 countries already having this important discussion and being brought on board. And um, I, I want to bring in um, the, the, the private sector, Christian. And, and um, maybe you could just tell us, what is the business opportunity and where has the challenge of plastics pollution been addressed successfully that can be replicated? And I'll bring in Sheila after that. Um, thank you very much for having me here in Kenya. Um, I'm here to showcase that a single-use plastic-free hotel in IE Tourism is really actually quite simple. I strongly believe that the consumer is completely ready to be plastic free or at least reduce the mountains of plastic they use or abuse. Um, however, it's up to the private industry to facilitate this change and to initiate this change. So seven years ago, I opened a tiny little hotel in Simreep, Cambodia, um, privately owned, not part of any chain, which means I did not have to listen to any kind of head office somewhere. And we decided from the beginning to be single use plastic free. This whole process took us a whole 10 minutes, plus ordering perhaps, so give it two more months. So um, I'm convinced that all of the, the complete tourism industry can make the change really quite quick if they wish to do so. Um, Jaya House River Park, 36 rooms in Sinrib, Cambodia. We're now seven years old. We have not had one single complaint ever. Um, the hotel ranks amongst the top 25 hotels in the world, according to TripAdvisor. It's got an enormously high Google ranking, and people can book us because of the fact that we walk the talk. People book us because um, people know we are making an effort, and we are indeed, as I said, single-use, plastic-free. Seven years ago, I was told I was a lunatic, and this would never work. Now, in Simrip, there are nine single-use plastic-free hotels. Because the other eight businesses have understood that it actually makes financial sense to, be, to make a bigger effort. In the UK, there's the expression, the early bird gets, uh, gets the worm. This is really it. The consumer, more than ready to be plastic-free, but it's up to the private industry to provide that change. And I believe, stop the talk, and start the walk. Thank you so much, Christian, uh, sharing that experience. I'll bring in Sheila again just to talk about the business opportunity and where uh, the challenge of plastic pollution has been addressed successfully. Okay, thank you. So uh, there are business opportunities across the full life cycle. If you were to just look at substitutes, we see a lot of companies already investing in substitute materials that can take us away from packaging that is and going to otherwise end up into a waste, um, into a landfill or a dump site. Um, so in addition to uh, substitutes, we're looking at companies who are innovating on green chemicals because as you know, there's lots of additives that go into chemicals. In a recent study from UNAP, there are 13,000 chemicals identified in plastics, some 3,000 identified as harmful chemicals. And so we're seeing growing industries looking at alternative, safer chemicals that can be used to, to bring about particular functionalities in plastics. We're seeing companies innovate on reuse and refill systems. Um, companies like Nestle and Unilever who are looking at what does it mean for how products are bought and sold and deposit return systems where you have reverse <laughs> vending machines that are being put into supermarkets in some locations where you can then return uh, bottles, get a deposit, return packaging, get a deposit, and then, of course, uh, investments in recycling infrastructure. Thank you so much. And those are some very, very practical you know, ways of infusing business opportunities when it comes around um, you know, the issues of plastic. I'll go back to the French ambassador and uh, maybe just ask this. What is needed? from each perspective to ensure a successful treaty, you know, that protects the planet 
and consumers. Thank you. Hope. First, I think we need this treaty, you know, before we implement it, and I'll come back to that. And, um, and it's, it, it's not only a question of lawyers, but the fact that we have this ambition to be legally binding uh, is, I think, the, at the core of the negotiations, because it will, it will provide some obligations. Um, so, and, and, you know, it's going to be a very tough uh, discussion. Um, I think, you know, I allude to the three pillars that we have, or three priorities that, as a high ambition, we're going we're gonna to be promoted. Um, I think it's all about also ensuring some transparency and reporting uh, that uh, this legal framework uh, can, can provide um, and, and give a sense of accountability, I think, for countries when they commit. Uh, there's also going to be a, a, a very important and difficult discussion on means of implementation, and that's where we think all sources of funding are required, public and private uh, funding. Um, but finally, perhaps I'll say that uh, we believe in the principle of a, um, the polluter pay principles. Uh, basically, that's a way that you, you create source of financing. Um, and I like to, I think it's been in your, uh, already in your survey, but uh, there's different models about that. But I think the development of the extended producer responsibility system, at least in France, had been fairly successful. You know, the industry have uh, realize that they need to come together uh, to pay for, um, uh, you know, the, the final use of their product. And but again, uh, speaking here also, it comes from the pressure of consumers that are more and more aware of what they consume and the consequence of their consumption. Yeah. So it's strengthening the consumer again, and uh, the consumer is core to this. I'll open it up to the other panelists, maybe just to make a contribution towards ensuring a successful treaty. We've had the three pillars. How could we, in our own individual and organizational capacities, ensure a successful treaty that protects the planet and consumers? Maybe I'll start with Dowdy. Uh, I think from where we sit, uh, we would like to first of all see a very ambitious and equitable global treaty that has effective measures along the full life cycle of plastics. That should be really the first stage for us. Uh, this treaty uh, should be able to address how we handle the harmful, you know, plastics along that, uh, uh, you know, value and along that chain. And we think that very importantly, because of the consumers, uh, is that the treaty should accelerate a just transition. There are people who will be affected by the rules. They are affected by the bans and things like those and we need to ensure a just transition so that it is you know, bearable for everybody, especially the consumer, uh, when, when we're looking at, at the effect of the treaty. Saroj? Oh, maybe Christian? You, yeah. And then we'll go to Saroj. Um, look, I only know the tourism industry, that's, that's all. But I think the tourism industry slash the hotel industry is actually the low-hanging fruit here. Um, Given the fact that I'm convinced that the consumer is ready, I would like and I would love um, you guys as an organization to call for an end of single-use plastic in the tourism industry. It was 2021, I think, in Scotland during one of the COPs that all of those big hotel chains saw the PR opportunities and made big statements that they will go single-use plastic free. Uh, one of them with 6,000 hotels by 2050. I think most of us by 2050 will be dead because of OH. Um, and ask them to expedite that a lot faster into the end of 2024. A year to go single-use plastic-free for all of the hotels and tourism companies around the world is more than enough. The alternatives are here. The consumers are ready. We just, it just has to be facilitated. If a, the Consumers International will take this stand, it will create shockwaves and, and waves around the world and will send the right uh, message to, uh, to the global population. Thank you so much, Christian. And it, it's a very important proposition coming from um, an experienced person from the private sector. So, Roger? 
Um, I just want to say that uh, the polluter pays principle is okay. It is unfortunate that many countries see uh, consumers as the polluters because waste, uh, plastic is seen as a litter issue and not beyond that. And so it, uh, consumers are considered to be uh, the polluters and uh, that consumers need to pay, which is really unfortunate when um, I was just giving that example, I, t I keep telling my friends also, when there is uh, lots of food on a plate that I like most, kept in front of me and then my hands are tied and I'm told not to eat. The situation is similar. Like, plastic is available everywhere. We are used, we have been consuming plastics for several years now and we are ready to change behavior also. So consumers are coming forward to change behavior, but they, that, then that should, the change should be facilitated by the other stakeholders, like the government and the uh, businesses. So the governments should have strong policies and effective enforcement of those policies. And from the business side, uh, the businesses should own responsibility, um, as Sir mentioned about uh, uh, the extended producer responsibility. They should also take uh, ownership to actually deal with the issue. And I think only if all stakeholders come together then we will be able to, and the, we, the treaty should have these components should, um, for, for the uh, success of this uh, treaty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sir Roger, and I'll come back to you. Uh, let me go to Sheila. And um, Sheila, how, how can consume organizations, because that's a huge representation in terms of a force, how can consume organizations advocate for an an international ambitious treaty, and what strategies can be learned from others? Thanks. I can, I, if I just reflect on the last intergovernmental negotiating committee meeting in Nairobi a few weeks ago, actually the consumer voice was, was not visible. So I know some of you were there at the, at, the, at the meeting, but actually the voices from the stakeholder side, we had 70 participants from the petrochemical side, we had some of the brands and retailers, we had some waste management companies, we had few consumer voices. And there was a discourse that was growing, which was actually consumers are not ready to deal with the plastic crisis, and that consumers want packaging, they want their textiles, which is half plastics, and many other sectors where plastics are used. And when I listen to many of you individually, I hear actually the consumers want to stop plastic pollution, but that voice doesn't come into the treaty strong enough. So I think that would be one very important piece is how do we mo go from the pilots that we're seeing to a scaled up system where when a consumer walks into, for example, a retail store, they're willing to refill their containers. They're willing to go back into deposit systems. Yes, with uh, probably uh, you know, uh, some money you get from sending back your, uh, your bottles like in the past, some 30 years ago we did that. But that voice doesn't come across. And so I would say that's the biggest message here, is that if you want to be heard, then you have to be at the next INC meeting and in Ottawa. Thank you. Uh, Saroja, I know you represent a huge consumer organization, Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group in India. Yes. So maybe uh, you could uh, maybe say something there again. How can consumer organizations, you know, advocate a bit more towards these ambitious treaty. I know there are very many um, consumer organizations represented here and online listening. Yeah. So I think we need to have conversations with our governments because there are several um, uh, 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 countries that are still not, uh, that play uh, low key uh, in the treaty negotiations. So I think it's very important that we uh, step up as consumer organizations. We have our conversations with our governments highlight, make sure that the consumer voices are heard. So uh, consumers do want to lead a sustainable life, but then um, uh, like the accessibility and uh, affordab uh, affordability of those sustainable products is still a challenge. 
So I think uh, we need to impress upon, we need to have those conversations with the government and with the businesses as well. So, uh, because uh, we have, um, uh, like taking the example of our, my country, uh, India, so we have the um, uh, rules on extended producer responsibility and um, uh, solid waste management rules and all that. And we have the single-use plastic ban as well of certain products, so certain items, not uh, everything. But then, uh, I think um, uh, effective enforcement is also uh, required uh, for, from the government side. And uh, we need to, I think, continuous engagement with the governments and also seeking media support. Media should also be writing extensively about these issues, bringing it to the forefront so that it uh, attracts the uh, attention of uh, the government and the businesses. And uh, yeah, so I see, I think this is one, this is an important way uh, of how as consumer organizations we advocate for, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, for uh, changes to happen. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And this, this is a challenge to all the consumer organization, including mine because I also represent a consumer yeah, uh, organization. Just one more point yes, I wanted yes, to please. add. Um, so actually, I'll be talking about it later, but uh, in the treaty as well, like uh, we recognize that gap, and so CI uh, represented, uh, has been representing in the uh, negotiations, uh, and uh, CAG has been um, representing CI in the negotiations to, uh, to ensure that the consumer voice is heard. So this is something, and we will continue this uh, uh, engagement as well. Just wanted to mention it here. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Saroja. I'll bring in Sheila again, and uh, maybe you could just um, weigh in on this. How are potential solutions being developed to ensure consumer acceptability? Because, again, it's the consumer that drives all this. So how are potential solutions being developed to ensure consumer acceptability? Thanks. So consumer acceptability, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is having consumer information. Because at the end of the day, the consumer needs to know, I mean, it's not just about the packaging, it's not just about, for example, many consumers don't know that half of all textiles is plastics. And so there's, many, there's a lack of information in just in your label of, of the product that you're buying. You don't, pro, consumers don't know, for example, what kind of additives have gone into that plastic and what is the safety uh, in that space. So I would say that would be one of the most important things where, you know, to be able to have an informed consumer, is, even if you want to be able to move away from certain types of plastics and uh, and in other cases, you, you have no choice, but that's the product that's there. You should be able to read the label in terms of the additives, whether it will be, not just whether it's recyclable, but whether <clears throat> it is going to be recycled. Because it's one thing to say this plastic is recyclable, and another thing that the country that you're in actually doesn't have recycling facilities to be able to recycle that kind of a plastic. Yeah, I'll bring in the French ambassador to this also. Um, from where you sit, how m are potential solutions being developed, you know, in ensuring that uh, there's consumer acceptability? Thank you. I, I, I don't think I have much to add what uh, Sheila was, was saying. I think uh, the key issue is that um, to have a, the necessary level of information and, and transparency. Um, and I would like also to come back to what she said. I think it's important that the consumer voice is heard in these uh, negotiations on, on uh, ending plastic pollution and treaty. Um, I know you're not necessarily part in the room as government will negotiate, but you can be observers. Uh, as, as the industry and as other stakeholders. And I'm actually, what you said, but the voice of the consumer were not strong enough during the INC. I think I will urge and call you to, to be better represented in your voice, to be better heard. Uh, because at the end of the day, the consumer are the mover and shakers in these discussions, you know. You can decide, I mean you, the global consumer. And I would like to say that 
Um, my personal sense, and I'm speaking on my own personal capacity, is that the consumer is not somebody from the north and from the south. Uh, this awareness about ending plastic pollution is shared across, across the globe. Uh, and I think um, this voice needs to be heard because we're gonna have, unfortunately, you know, during the discussion, fragmentation, but I think the consumer, and, and increasingly, the consumer is a global one. And, and his sense of, of uh, environment awareness is getting higher and higher. So I will urge you uh, to, be, to be more present and that your voice is being felt by the negotiator. I don't know whether, Christian, you could maybe share a little bit more your own experience because you were able to uh, do something a little bit miraculous where you are. Any other potential solutions to ensure... Cambodia, uh, um, Cambodia, Cambodia's tourism industry which is a tiny country in, in Asia with only very few tourists, uses 4.6 million single-use plastic water bottles per month. Cambodia does not recycle. We burn, we throw it in the rivers, and it ends up in the ocean. Um, and that's because every single tourist that comes into the country is uh, believes that they need to drink water bottles, plastic water bottles that are happily provided by the various hotels in uh, in the country. Um, thanks to a Lonely Planet um, article years and years and years ago, where they told people that oh my God, if you go to Cambodia, make sure it, the water bottle is sealed, it's covered, and only then will you survive. That really is 15, 20 years ago. Things have changed. The consumer now does not need to buy more plastic water bottles. However, the hotels, the tourism companies, they keep on providing because it's now a habit. I honestly believe this is the low hanging fruit. We could make a change in Cambodia of 4.6 million plastic water bottles within a year. Um, and that's 4.6 million water bottles that are thrown into the environment every single month. Now, that's only Cambodia. If you add the rest of the world to that, the numbers become staggering. Um, if we want to make a change, then this should really be the first change because it's so easy. The big hotel groups, they all made massive announcements, got their PR coverage, and um, some of them actively make others believe that they are environmentally friendly, have big things um, stated around to explain how good they are. But in reality, their rooms still have single-use plastic water bottles, single-use shampoo bottles in their rooms, and so on. The, it's time we become real, and I think the consumer is more than ready for this. And it's up to, um, I would love the consumer uh, organizations to call for an end of plastic and really contact the head offices of each of those big international groups and ask them for a date, i.e. the end of 2024, is that suitable for you? And then name them out. The, I think it's, we don't have much time to lose. The people of Cambodia are suffering. Um, climate change in Cambodia is very real, it's very visible, and people are being affected every single day. Thank you, Christian, and um, it's important that you, you pointed out a very important stakeholder group, big hotels. So I'll open it up again to the rest of the panelists. And uh, in which regions or countries or other stakeholder groups that have not been mentioned, do we need to see greater ambition? Where do we need to see greater ambition? Daudi, yeah? Uh, going by the last negotiations where... <laughs> Sheila and others were very uh, involved in, you will clearly see that the low and middle income countries in Africa, in Asia Pacific, in Latin America, showed great leadership in trying to push forward for a, go a global treaty. And, and they have demonstrated in their numbers uh, the affirmative action to want to have the treaty. But I think where we need the greatest ambition is in a small set of countries which have deep petrochemical interests. Uh, some of those who are the biggest producers of the raw materials for, for plastics. That's where I think we need the greatest uh, ambition because we saw from the last negotiations 
that these are the ones that deliberately try to delay uh, some of the progress that we want to to make. I, I know I can say this because uh, you know, no government is going to take me to stake, but this is where we need ambition. This is where we need commitment. Yes, there will be opportunity costs because they will lose something from their production functions. But when we look at the health of the, of the earth, of the planet, I think it's, it's a much smaller price to pay. And we need ambition from those large petrochemical producers to, to bring us home with this treaty. Thank you so much, uh, Daudi. And I think it's all about aligning interests so that everybody can sit on the table and really look at these things in, in, in a very practical sense. Saroja, would you have any contributions to which uh, maybe regions, countries, or stakeholder groups that we really need to uh, see more ambition uh, towards? As I had mentioned earlier, I think it's a collaborative effort. And when we talk about stakeholders, um, I think the uh, government, th there needs to be a political will from all countries' side, like, um, and uh, from, from all the countries to make sure. Because ultimately, it's, it's really surprising, but every one of us should understand that all of us are consumers, be it the government or be it the business. Every, each individual is a consumer, and every one of us are going to be affected by what is happening today. So I think it requires the political will and um, a consumer voice definitely needs to be heard in these forums because um, it, it only, only then it helps uh, them to bring about, because consumers are going to represent the ground reality, actually, what is actually happening and how they are affected by, uh, by this and what is the change that they expect. So I think it's necessary that consumer voices are heard and all the stakeholders um, uh, consider the interests of consumers and act accordingly, which is very important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even as we come to uh, a point where we are really getting to a consensus and the treaty really providing some light at the end of the tunnel, I just want to ask each one of you, what lies ahead and what are the knowledge gaps? I'll start with Sheila. What lies ahead and what are some of the knowledge gaps that uh, really need to be filled? Thank you. What lies ahead, well, it's the treaty in front of us. Next year we'll see, hopefully, the end of the negotiation and a globally binding treaty. Um, what lies ahead is also the ambition of the treaty. If it just becomes a waste management treaty, we may not as well have wasted everyone's time and all the money that governments have put into this negotiation process. What could be the possibility is a treaty that looks at the full life cycle, all the way from the beginning of the life cycle, which is when plastics are produced as from the petrochemical industry, to how they're used in products and to the end of the life cycle. Um, Christian, could you provide something? What li really lies ahead? What are some of the knowledge gaps that we really need to... I believe that, um, first of all, when I started seven years ago, um, and everyone told me I was a lunatic and it will never work, um, there was one sentence that I read and that is stuck in my brain ever since. I cannot change the world, I can't, but I can change my world. The, um, that philosophy has stuck with me and um, has now made us, as I said, the busiest hotel in town um, with a very high ranking and, and uh, zero complaints. I do believe th those companies, those initiatives, which really uh, means the early bird catches the worm, they will do okay, they will survive and they will actually flourish in years to come. Um, I think the consumer, um, thanks to social media, thanks to the various consumer platforms now, um, is a lot more aware, is a lot more intellectual, is a lot more informed right now than they used to be. It is only 15 years ago that the big hotel chains had the slogan, save a towel, plant a tree. 
I would love to know from any of those big hotel chains, where is their forest right now? Um, if you have 6,000 hotels and you have that slogan, they should have planted a billion or more trees. Thanks to Google Earth, that is now verifiable. Um, now, we need to use that technology in our advantage and, um, and, and educate the consumer even further because they will make choices um, based on reality and based on um, companies that perform and companies that are walking the talk. The fact that we all need to reduce plastic, that's a given. And the fact that we all want clean drinking water, that's a given. So all of those things should be, no should be the norm and hotels, businesses and the tourism ministry in general should um, be held accountable and asked for a day to stop for the very simple reason that this is the low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Sir Roger, would you, do you have something to say? And then uh, maybe after that we'll open up to a audience Q&A. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, consumers are the drivers of change, but they need initiatives that will empower them to actually um, uh, go for environmentally uh, conscious uh, choices. So I think uh, that is needed. And uh, I, I am ambitious, I should say. I look forward to a strong uh, treaty uh, in the coming days, coming months. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, I'll, I just want to open up um, a question and answer session from the audience. And uh, Camila will uh, help me with the questions and answers. For those, yeah, go ahead, Camila. No, I see many hands raised, so we're, we're trying to do our best. I will go um, here. Yes. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to contribute and also ask a question. Uh, you know, human beings are very uh, interesting species. We create problems, and then now we come around trying to solve the problems. I believe that you could not be here if a human being did not participate in the production of the single-use plastic. Nevertheless, we are in this problem and we want to solve the problem. So, I would like to suggest first and then ask a question. One, as members of Consumers International, um, I would request that we do a commitment or we sign an agreement uh, or a statement on how we are going to tackle a single plastic use. And that should be one of the requirements I'm suggesting not really imposing for all consumer organizations. So from there now, we'll have a mandate to go down to the grassroots and sensitize consumers uh, on the same. We believe strongly that if that comes from consumers international leadership, we'll be able to uh, have the strength and the stamina to go back to our people and tell them more about um, the plastic use. Uh, what I would like to uh, put across um, to, I don't know what is in the treaty, but I, I believe that if, the, if we cut off the source, then we can be able to solve other problems. We know which companies are producing the single-use plastics. In that treaty, I just, ask, um, I just want to ask a question, is there a provision that um, not only um, them to commit, but somewhere that they, they are going to abolish completely uh, the, single, the production of the single-use plastic. Thank you. Is, um, does anyone want to react right now, or do you want to hear the next question, the panelists? Yeah, and she, she did not introduce herself. I think she asked a very good question, but she didn't introduce herself. Uh, sorry. My name is uh, Dr. Alice Kimto uh, from Consumer Grassroots Association. I'm the executive director. Kenya. Um, yes, I'm going to go here. Excuse me. Okay, uh, my name is Yuni from Indonesian Consumer Organization. Uh, about issue uh, of plastic, in I think a uh, tax of plastic is very important. Why? Because rule of uh, reduce plastic not effective. Why? 
our organization have a, do, a, a survey uh, to the consumer, especially to a consumer of a modern market and a traditional market. The result is a consumer of a modern market is agree, are agree about a, a role of a reduced plastic, but consumer of a traditional market are not agree. So I think tax of uh, plastic is important, uh, like uh, uh, tax of tobacco and uh, sweetener, uh, sweet sweetener uh, beverage, like this. Thank you. Do we have one more before I'm going to the panel? Yes. Um, um, one moment. Michael, if you could put your um, translation. Yes, thank you. Uh, I speak uh, Arabic. I am uh, Mishal Al-Nizi. Mishal Al-Nizi from Kuwait, Raiz Jamiyat Himat Al Mustahlik from Kuwait. I have just a small observation, only a small one. Today, you have talked about the responsibility of ثلاث أجزاء حسب الكلام اللي تفضلتوا فيه أول جزئية تكلمتوا فيها أن لابد من المنظمات المستهلك المدني هي من تحاول أن توعي المستهلكين الجزئية الثانية تكلمتوا فيها بأن على الحكومات أن تضع تشريعات خاصة لنوعا ما يكون هناك تشريعات وقوانين خاصة في عملية رقابة المصانع أو رقابة الله بالإضافة إلى جزئية مهمة وهي أن أنتم دائما تتكلمون بأن على المصانع إعادة التدوير مرة أخرى في خاصة في موضوع البلاستيك وخلافه أنا قبل شهرين كنت في تشاينا وفترة الذهاب إلى معرض هناك اكتشفت بأن هناك بعض المصانع تتسارع لعملية تصنيع بعض الأجهزة الصغيرة التي بإمكانها كل مستهلك أن يكون في بيته أو في منزله جهاز لإعادة تدوير ما تم استهلاكه بمعنى بإمكان أن يكون يكون هناك ملاحظة أو اقتراح من خلال الحكومات أن يكون هناك بعض نقول إحنا السبورت أو الدافع أو التشريع الخاص لإعادة تلك المصانع بالتسارع لتصنيع بعض الأجهزة التي تكون لدى كل منزل أو مستهلك فبالتالي سيكون هناك إعادة لتدوير تلك البلاستيك وبالتالي سيكون هناك تقليل من كمية البلاستيك لدى العالم شكرا We're giving now the floor to the panelists and to the moderator to um, address the, the questions. If the panelists also want to interject, please um, let the, the panelists know. We will try to make another round of questions. We see many hands raised. We will see how we are on time and we will try to do our best. Thank you for your comprehension. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, yeah, so we, maybe we could get a response from the, I think the first two questions. Uh, I think we had a challenge with the Arabic translation, but we, we could respond to the first two questions. One about uh, the content uh, of the treaty and whether it addresses um, the stopping of production of plastics. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me take a, a stab at your question around whether the, there will be complete bans within the, the treaty. Uh, this is a negotiation, and bans and face outs are the tools available to negotiators to agree. You know, so they're very much on the table. I should say, though, that single use plastics, in some cases, in some cases, like medical use, they're not necessarily, you know, they might have to be faced out with time. But the ambition is to ban single-use plastics that are harmful to people and to the environment. And that's very much on top of the table in the discussions. But it has to be negotiated because this is a treaty. Uh, but this is the ambition of most of the countries which have showed leadership and willingness to move this forward. So in the next round of negotiations, 
this will really uh, be tested and, 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 and put forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, would you want to address the, the question from... Okay. Um, maybe you could just summarize the question again from um, Sorry, um, Indonesia. So it's again open for questions. I can see hands raised. She's just there. Next, just behind you there. Yeah. Second question. Yes. Yes. Could you make the question? Yeah, just quick? summarize Thank the question. You. Yeah. <laughs> In our government, import, uh, imposed tax, uh, there's a post plastic very important, yes. Would you agree that the bans of plastics are an important tool for, for taxes on plastic? What's your opinion, what's your feedback on um, taxes on the plastics production um, to the private sector? Similar to tobacco, if there is any, any feedback to um, have a similar system for plastics production. Yeah. So, of course, taxes are on the table as one of the issues for consideration. Whether that will make it into the final treaty is to be seen because member states will discuss it. Just like single use, just like taxes, whether there will be incentives or penalties, whether there will be what is called an extended producer responsibility um, requirement from governments to put in place so that producers um, have to pay a fee for you know, making sure that plastic pollution is addressed. All of that is on the table for, for consideration. Anyone else from the panel? Yeah, I think that uh, with regard to taxes, uh, I think the goal for us here is to eliminate harmful single-use plastics. And we know taxes don't do a good job in eliminating those sorts of issues. He stated the case of tobacco. There are very punitive uh, luxury taxes on tobacco, but tobacco production and, product, uh, and consumption continues to grow every day, even when they've written on the cigarette packet that this causes uh, cancer and can kill you, but human beings have a tendency to go for what can kill them. So uh, taxes will have adverse behavior because the private sector normally would pass the cost of taxation to the consumer and not necessarily solve the problem. So there are those where you can use taxes, but our view is that for those single harmful products to the environment and to people, especially single plastics, we should be looking for a complete ban uh, drive people to alternatives rather than use taxation. Thank you. Yeah, you want to say something, Sheila? Yeah. Maybe just because the questions have revolved around things like single use, but single use is just one aspect of the plastic space. And if we only end up with looking at phasing out or banning single use, not just bags, but plastics, we would have left out a lot of other short-lived plastics that make their way in packaging. There are many other aspects of plastics that are making their way into pollution. Just take, for example, microplastics added into cosmetics, for example. Um, there's fishing gear that is left stranded. There is textiles, agricultural plastics, a lot of plastics that today end up as pollution across the life cycle, not just as marine litter. Thank you. Sarojab. Do you want to weigh in on that? No, no, I agree with what uh, the earlier speakers mentioned. And uh, I think um, uh, yeah, that it should be completely banned. And um, uh, sashes, single-use sa sashes are a big menace today, actually. Everything is like use and throw. And they are contributing a lot to the pollution. So I think we need to see how to tackle sashes. While on the one side, we are talking about quality and safety. On the other, it's, it's, it's proving to be a menace. I think we need to actively promote ensuring quality and safety of products. We need to actively promote reuse and refill concepts. Uh, um, uh, because um, otherwise, it's going to be a major problem. And uh, yeah, we need to deal with this. Uh, back to you, Camila, just to take a few more questions. 
Yes, we will take two more questions, and I thank everyone for their understanding that we have um, limited time. If you can announce yourself before. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm George Sarian from India, representing Consumer Protection uh, Association. I have a couple of uh, points. One, uh, while appreciating the international uh, treaties, uh, you have mentioned 64 countries are uh, part of this uh, coalition. Uh, just any country becoming party to the treaty doesn't mean anything. Until and unless like the climate change uh, negotiations, we need to fix the, the target. For example, in the climate change, it is a reduction of the greenhouse emissions and things like that. For example, India produced 3.4 million tons of plastic and 30% is only going to recycle. Not increasing the recycle, but within a year, yeah, this country will reduce the, the generation of the plastic uh, uh, waste. Uh, uh, you know, generation by 30%. Something like that, the target is not attached. A country just becoming part of an international treaty doesn't mean anything. For example, in our country, uh, the single-use plastic is banned from 1st of July. That doesn't mean after a couple of months, uh, dull period, you know, which was not available, now all that single-use plastic items which is banned, it is back in the market. That is one point. So. Whether it is part of these targets are part of the international treaty, if not, whether uh, you can include in the negotiation. That is number one. Number two, uh, like my uh, consumer friend had mentioned, Saroja had mentioned, you cannot put that the entire responsibility on the consumers. If I understood correctly, you were mentioning, Sheila was mentioning, consumers are demanding for plastic bag. In the, in the, in the run-up to this session, we have done a survey in that, Indian consumers, 65.7 percentage are now uh, willing or carrying the jute or uh, uh, the cloth uh, bags. But the issue is, like mentioned, it has to be easily, the alternative uh, has to be easily uh, available and affordable like. So that is, EPR is not working with regard to the plastic waste. Of course, with regard to the electronic waste, up to certain extent is there. And one more thing with regard to this, the, not only the ban of single-use plastic, the, the packaging pattern. Uh, during the COVID and the post-COVID, there's a huge increase in the online purchase. So there has to be a complete change in the packaging uh, pattern. You know, plastic uh, should not be used any any uh, plastic. So these issues also need to be uh, considered until and unless it is translated into action, none of the international treaties mean anything. Uh, to the consumers on the ground. Thank you. Just to clarify, I believe, Sheila, you will clarify it, but um, the remark on the consumers, on consumers wanting plastic was on the part of some industry representatives at the negotiations. I, I, UNEP can respond better, and we'll have one more question yeah. afterwards. Yeah, my, my point was that because the consumer voice wasn't so strong, you know, we did, of course, have Consumer International and representatives there, but it wasn't as loud as some of the industry voices, which were saying that consumers actually want the plastic packaging. And maybe if I can talk about some of the online uh, packaging issues, there have been discussions about, can you ship in its own container? Do you have to ship with a container? Can you even change the product? You know, let's just take detergent, shampoo, can it be solid? Does it have to be shipped with lots of diluted water into, or liquids into it? And so there are many options. It's how it makes it into the treaty because at the end of the day, as the ambassador said, it's governments that are negotiating. So it needs consumer organizations and others to engage with their governments to come into the treaty process and engage with others so that these voices become heard and the options, whether it is, you know, the level of the, the targets, you know, what kinds of issues should be coming into it, bans, fees, incentives, all need to be heard by governments so that then they can consider it as they negotiate. But uh, you're right, it's not just having a treaty because at the end of the day it has to be implemented and it has to work for the very different interests that are there because otherwise we will just end up with a weak treaty or we will end up with an ambitious treaty that is unimplementable. So your voices are important to bring re realistic but yet, yet ambitious targets into the process. Thank you. 
Yes, uh, French ambassador. Um, no, thank you. Just want also to echo, I mean, uh, I'm, we, I'm talking about a representative of a government who's negotiating, and the tool we have in sort of international cooperation is a treaty. Um, and to have something legally binding is that the most ambitious things we can have in in international area. Um, you were mentioning the, the climate change and Paris Agreement. Some of these aspects are not legally binding, you know. So I think the ambition is there. Uh, whether it's going to have, you know, the, imp the desired impact uh, quickly, that's another question. And then I will, I will call all stakeholders. And I think it's, an import it's important that, you know, the government felt and feel that there's other stakeholders around them. There's the industry, there's the consumer, there's the public opinion. And everything needs to be factored in. Um, so it's not a question of who's, I mean, the government's negotiators are in the room, but the, the whole context is affecting the, the conduct of negotiation. So that's why it's important, I think, that those INC uh, discussion are, are not conduct unnoticed. There's a certain degree of pressure, uh, and especially from, from consumer that is being heard. So one, one last question. Yes, we will have two more questions and okay. then the final statements. Yes. Yes. Can you announce yourself, please, before the question? And make it short. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been wanting to make it short, and I will. Um, I'll just concentrate. I'm Felicia Shamonye, a professor of law at the University of Nigeria, Enugu campus, and president of Consumer Awareness Organization. I will concentrate on one point, which is already stated there, enhanced recycling infrastructure and technologies. That is, in fact, short term and long term. The short term should be this. There should be incentive for consumers to recycle uh, plastic. I know that in Nigeria now, the, some schools have a system whereby if people bring back their plastic containers. They just store them, then I uh, calculate at the end of the term and use that as part of the school fees. So you see that people just like to even pick plastic or keep the ones they are using in their houses so that uh, before the end of the term, they would have accumulated a lot. So you see that there's incentive there. And because there's incentive, there's no tendency to pollute the envi environment. So if we have that type of incentive, consumers would like to uh, recycle. Then long term is banned. They just have at a stage, at a stage, the governments must come together and ban the use of plastic. Because if consumers see plastic in the market, they must buy. And now manufacturers are making plastic very plastic containers very attractive. If you go to the market, you see that some of them are really beautiful. You want to buy them. So until there's uh, a ban on plastic uh, containers, consumers will buy. There's no amount of preaching that will make consumers not to buy this. I, I, I wish I could speak more, but she's just on me. Thank you for even giving me this. Thank you. Um, and one last question, please, very briefly. So we have time for all of the panelists to do a statement. Thank you. And don't forget to introduce yourself. Yes. Hello, I'm Shubada from MGP India. I just, I know there is no question. I just want to supplement. Uh, consumers should strongly, consumer bodies especially, should, should strongly dictate the market. And we should be able to tell our business community not to give plastic. Uh, we hold consumer plazas in uh, our, uh, through our organization, MGP. Almost 12 plazas in a year. Uh, more than hundreds of business uh, people come there. And we have made a policy that they should not give anything in plastic. And they adhere to it because there is a condition to participate in the consumer plaza, first of all. In our distribution system also, as uh, somebody has mentioned, we are very forcefully uh, enforcing the packaging material. The shampoos and soaps, uh, uh, toiletries which we get are differently packed in a very simple way so that no plastic wastage is done. The same brand 
sales in the market in a uh, normal plastic packaged material. But in, when, when they want to participate in our distribution system, they are not allowed to do so. So like that, we should be able to dictate. That's what my point is. And consumer body should be strong enough to influence and uh, enforce on to the business community on the uh, usage of plastic. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, the floor is yours for the last questions and the concluding remarks um, later on. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, the issue of plastics is, is obviously a very emotive issue. And uh, consumers being at the heart of this, it's so important that consumer organizations are able to you know, navigate this space together with the consumers to have solutions that really work for us. I will quickly move on to asking my panelists. Um, a proposed key action for co consumer organizations to spearhead change, as we quickly summarize the top three actions for consumer organizations to spearhead change. So I'll ask each one of us to make a contribution towards a proposed key action for consumer organization to spearhead this change. And I'll start from my farthest end, French ambassador. Thank you. No, I, I'll, I'll be very quick because I think um, as, a, as a country representing this um, coalition of high ambition, what has been said, I think, needs to be, your voice needs to be amplified. What you've been doing in terms of the hotel industry, for example, it's important. I think we need to, you need just to um, provide example that there's alternative solutions. And, and with political will or with will, with consumer will, and the, the consumer is increasingly aware uh, that you know, the market is going into that direction. I'm not talking about the government, but we can showcase that solution are, are possible and they are not, you know, um, they are within the market because actually that's what the consumer want. I think we'll, we'll have made great progress. Yeah. So, Roger. so um, as consumer organizations, I think we should be uh, advocating for uh, stronger policies and uh, effective enforcement of those policies which will actually benefit the consumers and also. Uh, ensure that um, affordable and uh, ac uh, accessibility and affordability to sustainable products uh, for consumers uh, are ensured so that consumers are able to uh, change behavior. Yeah. I would like to ask Consumers International to make a public statement where they're asking the complete tourism industry, hotels, tour operators, travel agencies, to indeed be single-use plastic-free by the end of 2024. Solutions are here, consumers are ready, we just need to do it. To accompany that call for action, perhaps uh, the Consumers International can then indeed put individual um, messaging or phone calls or emails out to the various let's say the top 20 hotel groups in the world, asking them for a specific commitment to be single-use plastic-free for all of their hotels by 2024, the end of 2024. I honestly believe it's possible. They just need to have a stick behind the door. Thank you. Uh, Daudi? Uh, uh, as an organization whose interest is really to ensure the health of the planet, we're happy to offer partnership to consumer organizations uh, to support their pursuit of clear goals here, uh, which include, you know, educating consumers, amplifying voice in advocacy, and pushing for a treaty that will help us to address the problem at hand. So we are available uh, to partner, to provide our expertise um, uh, to support this particular goal. Thank you. And I would add maybe to all of that is to push for standardization of consumer information so that consumers would have access to knowing whether a particular plastic is recyclable, but also know what kind of additives are in the products that, and the plastics that are being used, whether in packaging or any other plastic product. Um, so more informed consumers can then act on that. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and what I'm hearing as the key messages, even as we um, uh, uh, come to the end, is amplifying consumer voices that can drive change. You know, that's so important. Collaboration for effective change. We are now hearing about the treaty that we really need to support. We have 64 countries already on board. And investing in consumer-centric solutions that empower uh, consumers. So. I really want, at this point, to appreciate all the panelists. We have had a very, very uh, good discussion, and uh, maybe we can applaud them and just really appreciate um, their contributions toward this session. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, everybody out there who was able to participate in this particular session.